Hi everyone, my name is Omar. I have a PhD in civil engineering and I'm going to present you a study that deals with underground masonry walls. Now, this is the outline of the presentation. First, I'm going to present you the case study and the modeling and the results that we obtained. And then we are going to talk about two special subjects. The first one is the soil limit pressure at the vault sports. And the second one is a constitutive law for Mason. Currently, I work at CETEC, a French engineering firm that works, among many other projects, on the analysis and design of the new metro lines for the Paris subway. This study was carried out with the Université Gustave Eiffel in Paris and the RATP. Now, the RATP is a public authority that operates and manages most of the public transportation and its infrastructure in the Parisian region. The main case study here is that of the spreading of the vault supports as a result of nearby construction works as we can see here. The overall idea is to reproduce the behavior using a numerical model. Now, although the modeling of historical masonry construction has been the subject of many scientific papers, masonry tunnels are not a subject that we found very often. This is why we are interested in studying these structures. Right now in Paris, with the construction of the new metro lines and its induced works, this study is actually a hot topic. Our study deals with the station Marie d'Ivry, one of the southern ends of the Line 7 of the Paris Metro, that we can see here in the red circle. The station was built with a semicircular masonry vault, supported by two unreinforced concrete sidewalls and bound by a curved unreinforced concrete ground slab, and the span is about 17 meters. The construction of the station was carried out in the late 1930s. According to historical records, the construction was very delicate and several problems were reported caused by the swelling of the clay layer including partial failures of the tunnel construction at the time. Many years later, someone thought it was a good idea to construct a group of buildings nearby. Deep excavations for the parking lot and the foundations were carried out in a short period of time in 1983. Excavation is shown here. Little time after that, several structural problems were reported. Cracks at the crown, cracks at the extra dose, cracks at the slab, water infiltrations, and many others. These problems led to the setup of a series of measurements that revealed the subsidence of the mason revolt the increasing distance between side walls and the uplift of the slab. Measurements were taken from 1984 to 2007. In order to stabilize the deformations of the structure, from 1987 to 1989, a set of reinforcement works was carried out in the tunnel, micropies here, and a pre-stressed steel rods in the vault. The tie walls can be seen to this day, as we can see here in these pictures. Several hypotheses were suggested to explain these observations. One was the decompression, swelling and creep of the clay layer. Another one was the rise of the groundwater table. And the last one was the decrease of the passive earth pressure that could be mobilized at the right sidewall. And this last hypothesis is the one that I'm going to explore in this paper. Among the many ways to deal with the masonry problem, we chose to use a continuum approach with a non-linear behavior. A two-dimensional finite element model was built to study the tunnel. The masonry model that we used here it was developed in a previous work. The homogenization procedure is inspired on the approach proposed by Zucchini and Lorenzo for masonry. This technique produces an orthotropic constitutive law and the non-linear behavior is obtained using a damage model which was also used for the unreinforced concrete. The model was implemented in the finite element code CSAR LCPC. Before we start, let's talk about the initial stress state in the tunnel. This is very important since with no accurate representation of the existing cracks, the evolution of the stress and deformation won't be reliable. Ideally, an in-situ stress measurement should be carried out, like the one we see in these pictures. But since we didn't have any for this study, I proposed an approximate approach. 
soil steam next, next to the side walls and the pressure transmitted to the tunnel were chosen in such a way that the thrust line position in the structure lies within a distance inferior to 0.3 the height of the cross section relative to the mean line. This approach is accurate enough since some similar hypotheses were used when the masonry walls were conceived. The thrust line here is no other than the eccentricity of the resultant force. The modeling stages are as follows. First, the geostatic stress. Two, the excavations of the cycles and top section. Three, the construction of the vault and side walls. Four, the excavation core and bottom. Five, construction of the ground slab. Six, uh, construction of the platform. Seven, is the nearby excavation works. Eight, is the start of the creep for the limestone and clay layer that we see here in pink. Nine, is the setup of the micropiles and the tie rods. And finally, 10, the soil creep in the limestone and clay layer. To model the effects of the nearby construction works on the masonry tunnel, first we model the excavation and then we simply reduce the soil stiffness and its shear strength properties to take into account the alteration that occurred in the ground. Now, we have two objectives with this numerical model. One is to recreate the observed deformations and two is to study the limit earth pressure at the right side wall. The finite element model led to the following damage of the tunnel. In red, we will see the total strain tensor and we will see a concentration of strain near the cracks. And this is a comparison between the model results and the observations. The crack formation is relatively well reproduced. Overall, we can see that there are three hinges in the vault and three hinges in the slab. This figure shows the last in situ convergence measurements that were made, and also the results of our model. We see that the damage model works fine enough. Uh, for instance, if we take the convergence 35, we see that the measure was 54 millimeters, and the damage model also finds 54 millimeters, whereas the elastic model finds only 20 millimeters. And this is the horizontal displacement of the whole model. We found 2 centimeters of spreading of the fault supports. Okay, let's talk now about the analysis of the earth pressure limit state. The difference between a masonry vault of a building, a church for instance, and a underground masonry tunnel is that the latter takes support directly on the ground. As it turns out, the ground is at the same time its support and its load. Therefore, the ground next to the support is necessary to balance the thrust generated by the vault. So, the maximum pressure that can be mobilized within the soil is an important property if we want to ensure stability. As we can see here, the model results show that the soil next to the sidewall after construction is found partially in passive conditions. As I said earlier, we are going to explore the hypothesis in which a loss of soil resistance and stiffness was responsible for the spread of the vault supports. Here is a possible explanation of what happened. First, the excavation nearby were executed. Two, the soil next to the right side wall was decompressed and the stiffness and the shear strength properties were deteriorated. And three, the loss of resistance resulted in a displacement of the right side. What I wanted to illustrate with this calculation is how much loss of soil resistance at the support can the masonry vault withstand and more specifically, at which point the spreading of the vault supports can be considered as dangerous. It is interesting now to try to explain all of this with numbers. Taken to the limit with a finite element model, the failure mechanism looks something like this. We can see that this is somewhat similar to the failure mechanism studied for retaining structures. In particular, of those of embedded walls, such as this one you can see here. As an approximation, I used the formulas used for the limit state for passive earth pressure for embedded walls. 
um, and in this way I wanted to compute the resistance of the soil and see how it decreases. In the numerical model we reduce progressively the shear and elastic properties of the soil. And the idea here is to compare these two quantities. On the one hand we have P is the thrust coming from the vault and B the resistance of the soil. According to the standard approach, at the limit state of the compressed soil, equilibrium is found if this inequality is met. Now, we can consider that this is the loss of soil resistance. This quantity, lambda, is defined as the reduction of soil resistance with respect to a reference initial volume. In our case, we consider the resistance just before the excavation. All calculations made, I came up with these graphs. We found that the thrust P generated by the vault remains almost constant at 1 mega Newton per meter. And although the equilibrium condition is nearly satisfied all of the time, we see that beyond a certain threshold, the deformations increase rapidly. We found that a critical threshold is found when a loss of 55% happens or when a com vertical convergence of 10 millimeters happens. Now, I have presented you the damage model that we use for masonry, but what are the other possibilities for the measuring constitutive law? First of all, let's see what happens in the elastic domain. When it comes to modeling an old masonry tunnel, in engineering practice, most of the time we will assume a linear elastic behavior for the masonry, usually with a very low elastic modulus. A typical value is about 6 GPa. For comparison, structural concrete is about 30 GPa. One could argue that the low elastic models will produce higher deformation. When the safety criterion is measured in displacement only, one may think that this is the most unfavorable case, but it is not. When it comes to modeling masonry with cracks, a low elastic models is not enough. As we can see here, the deformations of the tunnel remains far below the measured values, which are about 54 mm. We could have never predicted the deformations produced by the nearby works with an elastic model. Also, we can clearly see that the hinge formation could have never been seen with the elastic model. It is clear that a nonlinear model must be used for the masonry. Let's jump to the nonlinear domain now. It is not uncommon to assume the masonry as an elastic, perfectly plastic material, using, for instance, the more Coulomb criterion widely available in commercial civil engineering software. Here, the cohesion and friction angle were proposed in such a way as to respect the more Coulomb criterion. Once the calculations were made, the main differences that can be highlighted are first, the strain softening behavior, typical of quasi brittle materials such as masonry or concrete, it is not represented at all as you can see here. Second, the elastoplastic model doesn't seem to show the proper strength concentration near the cracks, as we can see here. And finally, when we look at the crown crack, the stress distribution doesn't show the expected compressive concentration at the extra dose. For the same conditions, the deformations are lower than those obtained with the damage model, which are closer to the in-situ measurements. Given the sets of assumptions taken in this study and after analysis of the results, we can conclude the following. First, the damage model seems to give good results. Two, uh, we saw a three hinge mechanism in the tunnel with a 20 mm spread of the support. Three, we found that a 55% of loss of soil resistance it was a critical threshold for displacement. Four, it was clear that the nonlinear model must be used for masonry. And five, an elastoplastic model for masonry gives good results, but not as good as the damage model. Another interesting question is how far am I from failure? Because even if we use a nonlinear model for masonry, for complex loading such as excavation nearby, it's hard to find the ultimate limit state numerically. So even if I have a finite element model that converges, I want to know how far am I from failure? What's my safety factor? And in the framework of nonlinear analysis, current masonry standards will provide little insight to answer this question. So I'm currently working on some ideas to contribute on this subject. Well, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention.